I'm Steve Mosier. I'm uh, president of the Executive Council, and it's my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker this morning, Nigel Cameron. Uh, Nigel is president emeritus of the Center for Policy on Emerging Technologies in Washington, D.C., which he founded in 2007, and he's the technology features editor at unheardof.com. I'm just reading this because he told me it was mostly true. So, um, I know him in the 90s when he served as distinguished professor of theology and culture at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He was the first provost of Trinity International University. More recently, he was a research professor and associate dean at the Chicago Kent. Uh, College of Law in the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, Nigel has spoken at uh, ASA uh, meetings in the past, including the meeting in Edinburgh, and he was uh, one of the early speakers at our local chapter uh, in the Wheaton Naperville uh, area. So it's wonderful to, to have you back. Um, he's got a recent book called Will Robots Take Your Job? So we'll all want to get that book, I think. A plea for consensus, and the robots are coming, us, them, and God. So these are provocative uh, titles, and he's going to speak on human flourishing. So it's exciting. Um, his, his title is a question, um, a human century. Please come up, Dr. Cameron. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great treat to be here. Um, those of us who uh, live, work on the East Coast uh, always have a special uh, respect for those who fly from California and come to the first session of the day. Although uh, you can usually tell who they are looking around the room. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mike Paul for uh, not not least is really my invitation, but also picking me up at the airport yesterday. It was great to chat to a former fellow countryman. Um, and uh, also to my old friend, uh, Leslie Wickman. It's a great to treat to be, to be here now that she is the executive director. Um, I was, while I was chatting with Mike, I was reminded of a story from when I first immigrated to this wonderful, um, well, it was then it was a very wonderful country night. So more <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not going to mention his name. Um, Back in 1991, which does seem quite a long time ago, although this is a fairly grey-haired assembly, so, you know, we, we go back. And uh, I was out doing some shopping. We, you know, just, just moved. Uh, wife, dog, five small children, of course, that's all moved on. Uh, and the, the, uh, I was in the supermarket and talking to the young woman at the checkout, who was being very affable. Of course, people are in this country. Back in Britain, they all talk to each other, you know, while you try to buy things. And she, she said, you know, she said, where, where, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm British. She said, how long have you been here? I said, oh, just about a week. She said, your English is very good. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can do a lot with that story, but I'll, you, feel, 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 free to, feel free to help yourself. Um, If you go to Washington, D.C., where I worked for about 10 years, um, on the wall of the House Science Committee, which for some reason is now the high, it used to be the House Science Technology Committee, it's now the, the House Science Space and Technology Committee, even though the U.S. pretty much abandoned space, of course, 40 years ago. Um, on the wall of the House Science Space Technology Committee room, you see these words quoted from Tennyson, Alfred Lord Tennyson, the great Victorian poet, from his remarkable poem, Loxley Hall. Anyone heard of Loxley Hall? Any sort of humanities? Thank you very much, both of you. Um, <laughs> like people here. Um, a poem from 1835. And it's a futuristic poem. And you should, well, you can read it now, of course, on your devices. It's more interesting, well, in parts than what I'm going to say. Um, the two, two lines are quoted on the wall of the House Committee Room. I dipped into the future. Far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. Loxley Hall. Later on in the poem are words not quoted on the wall of the House Science, Space and Technology Committee Room. 
Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Words written, interestingly, back at the height of the Industrial Revolution, the original Industrial Revolution. And words, it seems to me, of profound significance for the 21st century. And this is, if you like, a, a thread. I have various beads. You'll wonder how they all fit together. But I, put, I just put them all on the, piece of, on, 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 the, on the piece of string, and you have to cope with that. I apologize for not using a presentation, that is to say a PowerPoint, which increasingly is now called a presentation. I was wondering to myself, it's a bit like, you know, the tree falling in the forest. I mean, if the professor makes a, makes a speech without a PowerPoint, did he, did he, did he say anything? Uh, <laughs> And I, I mean, I do occasionally use PowerPoint. It isn't a matter of religious principle with me. Um, when I have a lot of data to get across or something like, or I'm going to have a really sleepy audience. Um, but uh, I do generally prefer to use the spoken word. And of course, <laughs> I have the accent. Um, written in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, Tennyson is an interesting character for all sorts of reasons. He lived pretty much right through the 19th century. We even have earlier recordings of him reading one of his poems. And he was looking forward to a world of extraordinary change. A bunch of the poem is all about the sky and space and commerce in space up there in the blue and armies fighting up there. It is an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, the big issue of the 21st century is whether no, as knowledge comes, wisdom will continue to linger, or whether wisdom can begin to catch up. Will this century be one fundamentally marked as the century of the triumph of technology, or fundamentally as the most human century so far? in which technology has enabled, has empowered us to fulfill our human destiny? That seems to me to be the question. Context is one, of course, in which science, technology, engineering increasingly are one, in which you know, convergent technologies, we have all of this, all of this talk of uh, 10, 20 years ago, um, fascinating, that uh, terrific presentation we had last night from Doug Laufenberger, which framed the whole thing in human terms, of course, <laughs> is coming from bioengineering. I mean, the, 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 the cat our traditional categories, science, technology, engineering, as sort of clusters of disciplines. The significance of these things is beginning to evaporate. Uh, and uh, we find ourselves being pressed increasingly into the fundamental question, which is the human question. I think there's a sense in which you know, the old time science, of course the word is not that much of an old word, but back in the 18th century, you know, uh, you, you, could, you, could, uh, uh, you, you could be a demographer and you could be a clergyman <laughs> and, 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 you, and you could be a botanist. Um, and because there was so little information, uh, you could operate in different disciplines. And in a sense, we, the wheel has turned full circle because now, of course, data is almost indefinite. And um, it's, it's, it's finding ways to frame to frame all this information, to turn it into knowledge, and ultimately to find a context in wisdom, which is, which is central. You know, the trillion-fold decrease in the cost of computing of data processing, which we have become extraordinarily used to. And even though the Moore's Law curve is slowing a little, it's still moving up. And as we look ahead, we can anticipate that uh, pretty much everything is now going to be reducible to data, therefore remarkably easy to manipulate for good and for ill, and also <laughs> remarkably open to interference by those whom we sweetly call bad actors. This is, this is the context of this century. Of course, commerce and government, now far more significant in the development of science and technology than ever before. As we were <laughs> amusingly reminded, for those of us who think Schadenfreude can be perfectly okay with the 19% um, drop in Facebook's market uh, capitalization a couple of days ago, um, let's not talk about hubris and nemesis, the largest drop in value of any company in the history of the world, thanks to what uh, the Washington Post some had a wonderful piece two or three months ago um, on what it called Mark Zuckerberg's Sorry Not Sorry tour over the last 10 years. And it had all these clips from him going to every conceivable assembly in the world saying sorry. 
and then Facebook faces, faces the next challenge. Um, technology, um, extraordinarily powerful, increasingly powerful. How this will work for the human question. Now, um, you hang around long enough, as some of you know, and you get really interesting invitations to do things you know not very much about, but they come in anyway. And uh, three years ago, I was invited to go to Lisbon in Portugal to a conference convened by the Champalimo Foundation, which mainly funds brain research in Europe. Uh, but they've been going for 10 years, and they wanted to have a celebratory conference with a difference. So I had a letter from the chair of their trustees, who was then former Brazilian President Cardozo, one of the Brazilian presidents not in jail, uh, a, most, a most engaging and delightful man, which was beguilingly written, I have to say. We all get conference invitations every few days. This was beguilingly written, and it was also snail mail. Um, and it said, it said, a child born today may well be alive in 100 years' time. Depending, I, I'm always amazed by demographic projections because no one knows what's going to happen a week on Tuesday. But they say, oh, yes, yes, the actuaries say, yes, 50% boys born today alive in 100 years, something like that. And uh, I had actually had three new grandsons born in three families the previous year. So I found this particularly appealing, and I talked about them in my presentation. And asked they'd be invited back, or at least one and a half of them, to the conference in 100 years' time. <laughs> Um, and I spoke, the, the, the topic I came up with was the human question in 2115. And we had had, with the conference, had a wonderful dinner. So those of you who know Lisbon will know the um, Hieronymus Monastery, which is this ancient monastery on the banks of the Tagus. And we'd had a celebratory dinner there. It was, you know, I mean, some of these things you remember in the, in the old library there. It was a table with 160 of us, 80 each side. And we had this big candelabrum in front of each one of us, and also, it, was just, it was a lot of fun. And I said, you know, in a hundred years' time, will we do that kind of thing? Will that be at the heart of our sense of what it is to celebrate, what it is to uh, look back on achievement, to look forward, what it is to come together as leaders, as thinkers? Will it be something like that, or will it not? And this seems to me a, 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 a criterion in the way in which we think about what is being delivered by, by these technologies. So what I'd like to do in this brief time, I'm take three soundings in things that are going on and then draw one or two conclusions. And there are three very different kinds of things that are going on. First of all, what's happening in China with social credit. I'm sure some of you have been following this disturbing story, though most stories from China are disturbing. So what they're basically doing is taking something like our credit bureaus and letting them loose on absolutely every uh, point of data you can find. Officially, this thing will click in in 2020, we're told. Began 2014. And it's credit agencies on steroids. Um, and it's largely a voluntary system. It will be compulsory at the top level. So, for example, if you aren't pleasing the Chinese authorities, in one area of your life, they will make your life difficult in other areas. Um, quote here, they will allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. So in February 2017, this is a, you know, just an actual uh, um, data point here, um, one of the Chinese courts announced that up to that point, in four years, 6.15 million Chinese had been denied airplane flights. They were not allowed to fly. 1.65 million were not allowed to go on trains. And, uh, you know, whether you, you know, it's, it's illegal in China not to visit your parents, which is a bit older, I think maybe that's quite a good idea. Um, but it's illegal not to visit your parents. Um, this, this is now a law. But, I mean, factors like that, how often you visit your parents, and, you know, whether you search online for things they don't approve of, um, uh, what your neighbors make of you, all this peer, peer stuff, um, all of this goes into a centralized system. And will determine, you know, the, the, mor you, the mortgage rate you pay, wh whether you can get rent, rent, rent a flat, um, uh, anything that it requires anybody else's approval in your life will be determined by everything they've gathered about you. And this, this is a, it's a brilliant model of um, profound dehumanization and control. Um, it was, of course, C.S. Lewis. You can't go far without coming back to C.S. Lewis, who said in his little book, The Abolition of Man, 
interesting, 1943, in the middle of the Second World War, very, very interesting timing for that book, uh, talking about the meaning of technology, which is really what it's about, uh, where he says, you know, man's power over nature is in fact the power of some men over other men with nature as an instrument. And I think, well, that really could be <laughs> written on the wall of <laughs> the, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. That is exactly how it is working out. And my reference to um, Mark Zuckerberg's loss of <clears throat> $119 billion in value two or three days ago is certainly um, a reminder of a case in point. So, and of course, you know, the typical dystopia, Gattaca, one of my favorite films, um, the way in which ultimately knowledge, information, data is used to dehumanize rather than to enable, uh, enable human flourishing. Second, second example, very, again, very recent. Some of you will know about the Nuffield Bioethics Committee. Back in the UK, the UK doesn't have an official national bioethics committee as the US has in the last three or four administrations. I gather there's not one at the moment. Um, Okay, I'll tell you a story. I was talking to someone in the know in Washington about this. And he said, oh, apparently there had been some sort of push to the White House to set up another version of a National Bioethics Committee. And the two names that had been suggested for it were Wesley Smith, who's a friend of mine and maybe some of yours, writes for National Review, and Dr. Oz. So, <laughs> that apparently has not happened yet. The Nuffield Committee, set up about 20 years ago with, by, by a foundation, is a de facto National Bioethics Committee. And they have just produced a report which actually finally breaks this ground and says that we should not only permit non-therapeutic, we not only permit therapeutic germline interventions, and of course this stuff with CRISPR is now much, much more palpable than it was as a theoretical discussion 20 years ago when the UN and so on were discussing these things. We should now actually approve non-therapeutic interventions, enhancement interventions, just two criteria apply, that this must be good for the individual and good for society. Now, of course, Lewis was speaking about this back in the abolition of man, and up until pretty much now, pretty much every responsible, every authority and scholar who said, well, actually, maybe therapeutic interventions are okay, 25 years ago they were saying even they weren't, they say, oh, but, 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 only, only, only therapeutic, which of course itself is a messy thing, because how do you ultimately define norms and talking about psychology and so on, but this is out there. And I mean, my immediate response to it was, <laughs> I mean, the arrogance, the arrogance of today, you know, we all think that here we are, July 2018, we finally pretty much got it sorted out. But you go back to the 1950s, and racism was absolutely the norm. Um, you go back to the 1970s, and certainly homophobia was the norm. And the gay issue is a complex issue to discuss, but very few people remember that President Obama ran for office the first time as an opponent of gay marriage. I mean, changes take place very, very fast. And of course, you go back 100 years, here in the United States, eugenics was the norm. Eugenics was an Anglo-American project brought into disrepute finally by Nazi Germany. It was an Anglo-American project. Every Secretary of State was inviting everyone to the eugenics conferences on behalf of the US government. We know all this. And the arrogance thinking that today is the day we finally got it sorted. So we can decide what are going to be interventions for the benefit of the individual and for the benefit of the social order. Of course, at the moment, I think the latter is mainly a comment on sex selection type issues. Because at the moment, we think sex selection is pretty much a bad idea because look what's been happening in India and in China and so on. Um, but the notion that you can impose on the next generation or two or three or indefinitely whatever we now think is a good idea seems to me, I think Lewis is absolutely right, that this, this, is, the, you, this is turning uh, your progeny ultimately into what he called patience of your power. Um, I'll tell you a quick, <laughs> a quick story. <laughs> so, so, back when cloning was a big deal, 20 years ago, cloning was a lot of fun, partly because it got me on TV a lot, and I'm sure some of you too. Uh, we, you know, it was a big, big, suddenly an ethical issue became a big public question, and we can all jump in. And one of the fun things that came out of that for me was I was hired by a speakers bureau to go around the country on campuses having a series of debates 
with a very nice guy called Greg Pence, who's a sort of libertarian bioethicist whom I became quite friendly with. And we had a lot of fun turning up at campuses and being paid to slog it out for a couple of hours. And I always had the better arguments. He usually won the debates, but that was fine. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this is a Massachusetts story, which is why I thought I would share it. And so uh, the most unusual debate we had was in a prep school. Uh, here in Massachusetts, a very liberal prep school, I won't mention the name, some of you will know it, a 19th century religious institution which is now quite not where it was theologically, um, progressive prep school, and once a month they would have this big, big lunchtime do to get everyone together, this is kind of what, what prayers ended up with. In the chapel, lovely uh, wooden chapel building, about a thousand teenagers there, a lot of parents there, it was a special weekend, and Greg and I were going to have this debate, they broadened it, it was about, it was about cloning and, and, uh, and germline engineering, it was, all, it was a broader discussion. And so we were there in the green room beforehand, and, and they said, well, we've two things before you go on, we hope this is all right, we've got a choir singing a piece, and then we have a student activity report. So I think we were expecting the chess club, you know, or the, the softball team. I mean, so the choir sang a spiritual, which was great. And then we get the gay-lesbian alliance, or gay-lesbian-straight alliance, or whatever the terminology was then. And these two teenage girls saying how they'd come out. One was lesbian, one was omnisexual. I don't think I'll forget her saying that. And they had a faculty member, and, you know, God bless them. I mean, I'm really pretty open on sort of stuff, and I, you know, doesn't worry me at all. Then we were all asked to stand in solidarity with these people. And my colleague, Greg, and I said, he, he said to me, Nigel, we're guests. I think we probably haven't got to join in with this. <laughs> so we, we sat there looking distinguished. Um, <laughs> and, you know, a thousand people stood up. And then we got on to the debate. And Greg was out there arguing, libertarian guy arguing, yes, genetic interventions, germline, rah, rah, rah. So I stood up, and I, I mean, this was just too good to be true. And I said, look, I said, if we were all designing our babies, how many gay babies would ever be born? And a thousand people stood up and cheered. <laughs> and I won that debate. <laughs> but I think, I think you take the point. Third, the third uh, case, it's a case like these, these, I'm thinking soundings. I could relate all these if I had a lot of time, but they're, they're, they're beads on a string. Soundings. Recent work on the Industrial Revolution is really very interesting and very, very disturbing. You know, the general approach to technology in political circles and economic circles is don't worry about it, it all turns out right in the end, everyone gets better jobs, a bit of disruption on the way, but you know, sit down, shut up, and you're a Luddite. Uh, ignoring things like the Luddites actually were skilled craftsmen who'd been using technology all their lives and were being disrupted by another technology. They weren't the sort of Luddites of today who want to close everything down like the Unabomber. Um, recent work is really very interesting. For example, Andy Holday, who is not a sort of Luddite activist, he is chief economist of the Bank of England. In a speech to the labor union movement in Britain a couple of years ago, said that between 1700 and 1850, the unskilled labor force in the UK expanded and the skilled declined. In fact, the skilled portion of the labor force dropped from 40% to 20% over 150 years, which is the sort of the wider scope of the Industrial Revolution. The narrower scope is about 60 of those years. Halved. It wasn't they lost their skills. It was their skills were no longer wanted, and they were either competing with children to work in the factories, half the jobs, Industrial Revolution factories in England were designed for children and were done by children. They were competing with children and machines designed to be worked by children, or they, of course, were competing in the fields with unskilled laborers. There was a radical de-skilling in the labor force. Um, and very recently, an article by Carl Benedict Fry and two colleagues. Um, Fry was the guy who, with colleagues, wrote this report back in 2013, going through every job in the Department of Labor job classification, all 903 or whatever it is, and analyzing them um, mathematically for their uh, capacity to be turned into robotic jobs. Um, and Fry has now turned his attention to something a bit closer to home. <laughs> um, what's been going on um, in the, if you like, the Trump hinterland in, in the, the, the um, flyover country um, of, of, of America in these, these last 40 years. And he says, in fact, that the, the 60 core years of the Industrial Revolution in, in, in Britain, uh, which would be by 1780, 1840, are almost exactly the same in profile to the last 40 years 
in the US. That is to say, skilled, work, skilled labor, lower middle class, stagnation, and drop in income caused by technology. Um, and he, <laughs> he has a very memorable sentence in his article, which I'm certain never, for one will never forget. He says that the Industrial Revolution in Britain did not simply end with the railways. It ended in 1848 with the publication of the Communist Manifesto. Technologies have consequences. And it was mentioned, I wrote a book a couple of years ago for Proletary and Wiley about robots and jobs. As a risk issue, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's draw a risk matrix. Let's get worried because really bad things might happen. And let's begin to prepare. And having read this piece by Carl Fry, I think I'm a bit more motivated by being reminded about the publication of the Communist Manifesto as one of the results of what took place. Of course, by about 1860, everyone got better jobs, economy is moving up. There's still been a big redistribution of um, uh, value between labor and capital. But the new base began to rise. And everybody was happy. <laughs> but this was everybody's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It wasn't the everybody's of the first generation. Fry also makes the point, which is a point in his segue to Trump. Of course, he says, in the first part, early 19th century, the workers did not have the vote. The human question. Why does the human question matter so much to us as Christians? Now, I think one of our difficulties in this discussion is we've tended to regard human as not necessarily a good thing. That is to say, we, uh, you know, Jesus was divine as well as human. Uh, humanists have sort of captured that word as an anti-religious term, even though that's not really what it meant historically at all. You know, Erasmus, you know, the great uh, sort of intellectual of the Reformation was, was his, you know, was a definer of, of, of Renaissance humanism coming in, into the Reformation period. Um, but the centrality of the human um, in the technology-driven world is something which seems to me Christians need to capture and to articulate and to understand is at the heart of what it means to hold our creed in this generation. A couple of uh, quotes I love from the 19th century. Uh, one from Charles Wesley, for those of a Wesleyan disposition, um, about the humanity of Christ. Because this is the point. Human matters because we're made in the image of God, round one, and round two, because precisely because we're made in the image of God, the Son of God can take human form and does to himself. And that human form has not merely been left behind. It isn't merely an epiphenomenon of salvation history that Jesus was human. I think one of the most undervalued doctrines of the Christian faith is that of the continuing humanity of Jesus Christ. So, yes, Wesley, for those of you who are Methodist Arminian, of our flesh and of our bone, Jesus is our brother now. Well, for the more reformed among you, like me, Charles Hodge, you know, who was the most significant American conservative theologian of the 19th century, um, uh, down, down, down the road to Princeton. Um, the one who sits on the throne of the universe is both perfect man and perfect God. And the core Christian belief is that of the incarnation of the Son of God. And his incarnatedness, which of course is the theme of the Gospels, which are a good block of the New Testament. Evangelicals have not been very good at taking the Gospels seriously. We much prefer Romans, you know, it's a lot more fun, you know, we get into the whole scheme of things. But for some reason, Jesus did spend three years or so of his life going around doing good, causing a lot of trouble, and teaching and uh, manifesting this incarnation, which wasn't some sort of theoretical blip in a scheme, it was an actual encounter with human life, human form, human flesh, without sin, but in every other respect, the human flesh and the human form that we have, and which we now find ourselves, <laughs> those, <laughs> this, this, is, this is, it's our legacy, it, it's, it's, it's that which we, um, as, as believers, as we move into this, increasingly technologically defined context um, are those perhaps the last and the most significant of those who see this as central um, to 
uh, what it is, what matters for the human community. Um, one of the interesting things about Christianity, <laughs> compared with all other religions and ideologies, is the way in which we are, have been able to balance uh, the corporate and the individual. That is to say, uh, we believe heavily in the radical unity of the human race. And equally so in, if you like, the unity of those um, called out of the mass of the human, the human family into the elect, into those, the family of those within, within the fellowship of, 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 of faith. And yet, equally, we uphold the dignity and the accountability of the individual. And in a certain sense, we, we, we have, you know, we have 100% of one and 100% of the other. Versus, versus those who, sim simply in terms of the mass and, of course, the 20th century, which in many ways I see as a sort of blip. I think the 19th is much more relevant to the 21st than the 20th was. The 20th century was fundamentally about the defeat of the great mass ideologies of communism and fascism at absolutely enormous cost, phenomenal cost. Um, ideologies which had their origins, of course, uh, back, in, back in, the, in the 19th century. Um, in the 21st century, there's a balance to be struck. Increasingly, we're pulled toward, if you like, the other extreme. Whether, whether it's a libertarian, the libertarian view politically, and you can be Ayn Rand and so on, you push this to, toward an extreme. Or, of course, the other kind of, of individualism, I mean, the, the sort of the pothead, you know, the... Um, New Ager, the, there are various ways in which you can frame that sort of individualistic decision in which you ultimately deny that, that, that no man is an island, that you're part of, a part of the main. Um, the, these seem to me to be the extraordinary alternatives that within the Church of Jesus Christ we're able to bring together. So by saying the 21st century needs to be about the human project, we are saying neither it needs to be about the mass human corporate project, nor about merely the individual project, but about our vision of human nature, in which, if you like, our Lord himself is one of us, and, as Scripture says, also the first of many, of many brothers and sisters. So, back to Tennyson. Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And I'll give you context here, because with Bible texts we tend not to, <laughs> tend to ignore the context, we just use the text for our purposes. That's a joke, but it's not an entirely unserious joke. Um, Tennyson, knowledge comes but wisdom lingers, and I linger on the shore, and the individual withers, and the world is more and more. Because that's precisely the point he's making. And that seems to me at the core of the agenda of the 21st century. The thriving of the individual, free and responsible, under God, as our technological powers flourish, our accountability under God for our brothers and sisters, and our wariness of technologies, use of technologies, in which Ala Lewis, conquest of nature, use of nature as an instrument over others and in a context and I'll finish with this in which of course the largest five largest companies in the world even despite what happened to Zuckerberg a couple of days ago are these new technology companies in which we have utterly failed to respond to them with the kind of antitrust approach we took to rising monopolies in the past in which they have become far more powerful than they need to be as they snap up Six, um, competitors and uh, new rivals and in which we as those who use these companies and who applaud many of their uh, dimensions and capacities and services as this wonderful DARPA invention of the internet taxpayer funded you know handed to Silicon Valley now enwraps the world with the kind of potential for the power of some over others, which Lewis spoke about, which this is the environment, social and technical, in which we find ourselves. How, in the 21st century, we end up nailing down human freedom, human flourishing, as that which is primarily enabled by 
these remarkable human achievements under God. Thank you very much. We have time, uh, plenty of time for, for questions, and uh, I thought maybe I could start with a question. Uh, this morning at breakfast, I, I was having a conversation with, with two people who knew, uh, had relatives or, or had known people who were involved in the Manhattan Project, and, and mm -hmm. were quite disturbed when they learned what they had done uh, in their, their labor, because it was all secret. Mm -hmm. And my question is, as scientists and uh, uh, technology specialists, engineers, um, what, what, what's our role in this? Um, how can we be positive um, agents uh, in, in the 21st century in our role as scientists? I, I think that's a, it's a, it's an extraordinarily um, central question, not least because so much of this activity is now taking place in private corporations, where there's far less accountability than there is in the government context, as of course there was in, in, in Manhattan. Manhattan, at least you could say, well, this is the government, you know, we voted for it. They're, you know, there's a, there's a different kind of accountability in that situation. I think one rather interesting thing, I mean, I'm not really a sort of bomb-throwing radical, but we've seen these examples in the last uh, two or three weeks of uh, several of the big technology companies have had pushback. Uh, Microsoft just a few days ago by employees asking about Microsoft's contract with, uh, with uh, ICE. Um, and then early, I think, in three of the big tech companies about collaboration with, uh, with the NSA. And two or three of these companies pulling out of contracts because pushback, because of course, if you're in Silicon Valley, you need engineers, and engineers <laughs> come at a high price, and you disaffect your engineers, and they're gonna walk. Um, and the, yeah, very interesting, this, this little strands of, of a surprising kind of accountability, because by and large, people who are tech companies have not been known to be polit political people. Um, but I think, I think that's one emerging strand here. Um, I think at the end of the day, I mean, the Nuremberg defense is no defense. You can't say you were just obeying orders, which cannot be you know, um, a justification of, of, of anarchy in which everyone makes all their own choices all the time. But I think if you like, if you like kind of moderated anarchy, that is to say, ultimately, we are responsible for what we do and what is done with our stuff. And we have in conscience to, I think, come to terms with, with that sort of, sort of moderated accountability and the fact that we ultimately can always walk. Um, one thing I find very discouraging is so many people in, in public life and in professional life uh, who get involved in bad stuff. Um, the, the, the notion that they can just walk, you know, that they actually haven't got to do it. And yeah, walking is a problem. I mean, you end up with no money, you know, or you end up, you know, with career messed up. But I mean, so what? And those of us who believe conscience is primary, that really shouldn't be a problem. Um, I've, I've been asked to uh, select a, a question, so I was intrigued by your comment about saying that the end of the Industrial Revolution in England was the Communist Manifesto. And that then, you're, if I understood you correctly, you're saying that there's a comparable end, if you will, to the Industrial Revolution in the United States with the rise of what's the feeling with Donald Trump's message. The one thing, though, that I'm trying to understand is that, if you'll pardon the bad pun, the elephant in the room in the present situation is that the dislocating effect of technology doesn't seem to be part of that message, but instead saying that we can continue to follow the Industrial Revolution model as long as then we set up appropriate trade agreements or otherwise bring those jobs back. And so I'd like to explore that or get your take on this to then say, is there really a signaling of an end comparable to the Communist Manifesto in the United States with the rise of what is the feeling with Donald Trump if that whole area, if I'm not mistaken, of technology and its displacement hasn't been addressed? Well, thank you. It's a very, very yes, interesting way of framing the question. Um, 
And of course, I mean, the most recent example is because of this latest this trade spat causing problems in agriculture. We have another 10 billion, 12 billion dollars being handed out, you know, to American farmers, most of whom, of course, are corporations, um, to sort of buy them off um, in a sort of rather random way, not driven by policy, just driven by the need to tamp down um, the backlash. I, I don't think, oh, I don't think anyone seriously believes anyone who is not committed to the Trump agenda, and even most of his people aren't committed to his agenda in, in, the, in the trade area. I mean, Navarro is pretty much on his own here. Even Cudlow doesn't agree with most of this stuff. And he's a crazy guy himself. But um, the, the, uh, I don't think there's any serious opinion that he can, that, that basically you can bring back all these jobs and you can make the Midwest, you know, traditionally, pro people are going to have these, you know, 30 buck, buck an hour jobs and so on and so forth, like they did 40 years ago. I don't think anyone seriously argues that can happen. I think talking about it happening plainly has had political benefit. I think even, even U.S. Steel is in difficulties, even though it, it's the one company which seems to be seriously benefiting from what's been going on. Um, I mean, just, just to flash back, I mean, David Ricardo, who was the most, probably the second most distinguished economist in history after Adam Smith, certainly in, in the British tradition. Um, Ricardo lived through the Industrial Revolution, and he is the man credited, although this is now debated whether it was really his idea, but he has been credited with being the guy behind globalization because he came up with a theory of comparative advantage, which as economists in the room will know better than I do, I have a mere MBA, which I did in my spare time a few years ago for fun, um, is actually a much more complex idea than it seems. But the basic idea is that you do what you're best at and we all benefit. And Ricardo agreed with the Luddites. And he's on record, he agreed with their analysis. He said this is gonna be disastrous for, 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 the, for, for skilled workers, workers in England. But he said, because of course he believed in his own theory about globalization, he said um, this will be disastrous for them. And he said, if however we stop these technologies, they will go abroad. And then he has this marvelous phrase. He said, then these jobs will be um, annihilated altogether because they'll all be done by the Portuguese and the French and the Germans and so on. So he was keenly aware of that. Um, and he saw, therefore, a certain inevitability about the way in which technology is going to cause disruptions. Um, I'm not sure standing, you know, you can canute like, just sort of stand there as Trump seems to want to and halt those developments. I think you can mitigate them, but that involves, I think, a much more sophisticated approach to policy. Articulate your definition of the human. I'm sorry. What is the human question? The human question. I think, I think I know what you mean, but I'd like mm. to hear you articulate your definition, if you would. Well, there are. You know, there are. <laughs> What was that, that famous example of the, the guy who said, well, I, you know, I can't define it, but I know what it is when I see it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think, well, if, like at a theological level, we can talk about the flourishing of humans made in the image of God uh, in the terms in which God intended them to flourish. It's a sort of secular notion, but that, but that you know, humans, humans doing what God really made them to do. And I think within notions of humanism and non-atheistic humanism, which we, you know, we look at, you know, the humanities, you know, which is a term we use for this whole clutch of disciplines, uh, historical, cultural, uh, linguistic disciplines, um, in, in, in notion, notions of culture, um, notions of relationships, healthy relationships, uh, freedom of decision making, there's a whole clutch of things. And of course, human rights, which I have not mentioned, which in a sense was the one interesting thing that came out of the 20th century, um, and which was a fundamentally Christian project. I mean, the Enlightenment, um, did good and bad things, but it essentially secularized some very good things and made them sort of publishable to the, the wider world, at the heart of which was the notion of human rights, uh, which I think is fundamentally, a, 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 it's basically the, what, what does it mean if you're made in the image of God? Uh, it means to have rights, responsibilities, which have come out of this special dignity. Now, of course, you can pull and pull it in different directions and do crazy things with it. Um, but that fundamental idea of human rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, foundation of the United Nations system, I think is enormously important. So I would, I've said to students in the past, and I'm now saying this to smart people who know much more than I do about a lot of these things, but get away with things to students, can't you? Uh, I said, you know, the, the, the two, perhaps the two most consequent documents of the, of the 20th century were Lewis's Abolition of Man, 1943, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, well, five years later. Um, 
So it seems to me there's, there's a clutch of ideas there. I think we can't define this thing. We can't come up with, with ten points of, of, of human flourishing. But I think part of it is just we know it when we see it. Um, it's not taking kids away from their parents because you want to punish the parents by punishing kids. Um, you know, it's not you know building gulags in in North in North Korea or, or in Siberia. Um, uh, but neither neither is it uh, mothers looking at their mobiles when they should be talking to their kids. I mean, there are all sorts of levels to dehumanization. I think you could have different models. I just did an example of, of, of the mobile thing. I've just written a little a Christian book about um, um, mobiles and, 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 and us for, for people in Britain, so they call mobiles rather than cells. Uh, and, uh, and I give a story. I mean, some of you have heard of Tiffany Schlein, whom I interviewed recently and uh, whom, I, whom I've known on Facebook for many years. Uh, she's a filmmaker. She founded the Webby Awards, which is the, sort of the Oscars of the Internet. It's a big deal. And she's writing a book now about what she calls a technological Shabbat. And her family... You know, they're not they're non-religious Jews, but basically Friday night, Saturday night, everything is off. Absolutely everything. She says it's transformed their lives. I mean, there are things you can do. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a human thing. I love that. It's a, you haven't got to do it, but it's a human thing, and I love it. So I think, I think you know, it's, there, there are, there are sort of, you can, there's a smell here, you know, which can get stronger, which can be unclear sometimes, which tells you this is, this is a human thing, and that this is good. And I think the our, this is the challenge we have, and those of us who are in the tech business one way or another and don't need to know about this stuff, and who are trying to live as Christians, um, and most of us have families of various kinds. I mean, I've got 13 grandchildren now, goodness, my final daughter is just getting married and she wants to have some more. I mean, all those Christmas presents, you know. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're in this business now. This generation is the generation. We've got to find a way to sort these things out and enable us to live. Well, of course, you can go back to Lord of the Rings, you know, and Frodo and the Bill, all that kind of stuff. I mean, there, there are various ways of imaging, you know, the good, the good human life, which needs to be compatible with the high-tech life. Mark Strand, North Coast State University. I uh, want to explore your suggestion that technology is a kind of excuse for humans to control the world. You know, Friedman said technology has made the world flat. I think some argue the internet is the great democratization of the world. Um, I tend to sympathize with your position, but I'd like to hear your comment regarding some who would say no religion is the excuse to control people. And those technologies have made the world flat and democratic. Yes. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I, I need help answering it. I, yeah, you know, I, okay, a couple, couple of comments without, you know, writing a dissertation here. Um, I think, guess what? We're humans. We're fallen. Was it Chesterton? You said original sin is the one Christian doctrine capable of empirical verification. Boy, was he right. Um, <laughs> And so we will use anything we can to try to control everybody else. Anything and everything is good, bad, indifferent, you know. Well, use a Bible. Oh, goodness gracious me. A number of Christians who use Bibles to control people in the sort of Celtic end of Christianity. Goodness. You know, so we'll use anything we can. Anything that comes to hand, because controlling other people is a big part of the whole sinful deal. Um, so, um, of course... Religion, and I, I mean, I get more anti-religion every day. I have to confess. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian Christian, mainstream, mainline Presbyterian. I much prefer fighting liberals to fighting conservatives, so I'm stuck with the mainstream. Um, that's a that's a joke about. Let's go. I'll go. Yeah, um, and and uh, yes. Gross, gross abuse of religion, of course, in the latest Catholic stuff. Peter, I mean, oh my, just, just, just horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we, we can't just go back to being like Jesus and not associating with believers and so on. But our churches need to be far more transparent, accountable. And I think my suspicion is we've just begun the beginnings of the the evangelical pedo sex sort of scandal stuff. I think that's going. It's, it's a different. It's going to come out increasingly. I think really bad stuff. But. Um, technology is almost by definition a control mechanism. I mean, you know, from, from the, the ads and then much later the wheel, um, fire. I mean, the, the, these, are, these are all leveraging efforts. And you can you just do more because you have, you have the technology. And therefore, 
whatever that, you know, if you're trying to do good, trying to do ill, but of course, because of original sin, the, the pointer is keeping pulled this way, and you've got to be pushing, pushing, pushing. And so I think, I think it's an inherent problem. And therefore, one doesn't at one level blame people who are pulled in that direction. Um, but I think, just to take a, a relative, relatively trivial example, but it is a non-trivial example in and of itself, it's, you just look at the way in which, in which uh, the spread of the cell phone, and of course the smartphone, with all of this marvellous stuff it can do, very little to do with the phone, um, is distracting mothers, many mothers, from their children. Fathers too, but fathers tend not to be around their kids so much. And within the church, as much as anywhere else. It's so walking down the street. They would be talking to the child in the stroller, 15 years ago, now they're chatting with their friends. Because the pull, the pull, the pull. And therefore, I think, technological power makes being human, being Christian, being moral, much, much more difficult. And are we up to it? Well, apparently God thinks we're up to it. You know? I mean, one thing I said in this book, I've just been writing this book about social media and mobiles. I think he said, okay, Babel is behind us. You know, basically now, we're on the verge of being able to talk to anybody in the world in real time. We're, we're getting very, very close there now with, tra with in translation technologies. Uh, Babel, is, this is a fundamental theological question. Babel is behind us. I find it very amusing that, um, of course, we have all these, these translation um, companies and uh, apps called Babel, Babelfish, but whatever. There are dozens of them. And probably not one person in a thousand who works for these companies or uses these realizes that this does not come from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> you know, Adam's got this from the Bible. <laughs> but, you know, you have to, if you enjoy irony, you can enjoy a fallen world. <laughs> I'm Adam Treacy. I'm a high school teacher in science. Um, you, you made a point about talking for, uh, uh, about the, the question of whether we would choose our children to be gay, I guess this is more of a comment, not, not a yeah. response, but I guess it raises a question we have to grapple uh, that God has chosen to make some of us gay. Uh, so I'll leave that at that. But my question to you was when you mentioned this, the House Committee on uh, Science, Space, and Technology, uh, I wonder, being a little greater than myself, I was born in 72. My understanding is in 1973, through Gordon College Conference on nucleic acids, the, the idea was born among molecular biologists to contain recombinant DNA. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's been any serious discussion of using space to contain recombinant nucleic acids. Well, and the answer is, answer is I don't know. Although there is a lot of fun stuff popping in space. I mean, it is extraordinary when you begin to look around. There's very little federal interest. It, it seems that you, some of you, I mean, you may not know this, but one of the most interesting statistics in American history is that I think it was around 1967, almost 5% of the entire federal budget went to NASA. It's now around one tenth of that proportion, despite. Rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric. Some of you will have seen, some of you may be involved with some of this fascinating work about uh, mining asteroids, which I think is really quite extraordinary. There's a lot of stuff out there in the literature about it. And they've now found an asteroid uh, which um, is so packed with precious metals. If we brought them all back, we could almost make everybody on Earth a billionaire. Now, of course, you'd have to find some way to maintain, you know, to maintain pr the pricing of scarcity in this new, this new environment for that to work. But I think some really fascinating thing, thing, things are beginning, are beginning to happen. And I think we're going to have a lot more, if you like, commerce in a sort of general sense with space, a lot more coming and going. Now this private enterprise. I mean, one, one of these asteroid exploration things is, is about sending up a traditional sort of rocket, and it sort of bursts open, and you've got about 100 little things floating out there. Into other, and so I mean, miniaturization in space is something really very new, uh, which is going to make things an awful lot cheaper because, of course, the, 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 weight, the weight issue. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think tracking the space thing is, is increasingly interesting for those who know not very, not very much about it. Um, I, um, one of the joys of my life was meeting Neil Armstrong. Um, at a reception in Washington some years ago. I had a great chat with him. I had discovered during the event when he was being presented that he and I shared a birthday. Now, mine was a few years later, but <laughs> we shared a birthday, August the 5th. Interestingly, Tennyson's birthday was August the 6th. It would have been kind of fun if we'd all been the same day. Um, so I had, I had a great chat, chat with, with, you know, the man, you know, and one of the most modest men you will ever meet. 
Um, it's interesting how <laughs> technology is not breeding people quite as modest as that in the age of Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. No, I have, I, I divert, but thank you. Well, we're out of time. Thank you very much.